start and the first 10 minutes in loving and kind thoughts to yourself and the rest of the time to a spiritual friend, somebody of the same sex, they are alive, not a member of your family. So the rest of the time, send loving and kind thoughts to your spiritual friend. Okay? Okay, while you're walking, keep your eyes down and just like you're taking a walk with your spiritual friend. Radiate loving kindness to your spiritual friend. Okay? Don't walk slowly, honest. You'll, you'll see the advantage. And also, when you get out into your daily life, you, you can have more of a chance to send loving kindness to your spiritual friend while you're walking from here to the car or walking from one place to another instead of just letting your mind chatter and play all kinds of games. So get in the habit of sending loving kindness to your spiritual friend while you're walking. Okay? See, the thing is, because I was working with hospice and I was working with people that were dying, I taught people that it's okay to cry, not to hold in the pain. If they hold in the pain, within two years, they're going to have some kind of major physical problem. This is what grief counseling is all about. There, a loved one dies, of course you're going to be sad. And it's okay to be sad. Don't push the sadness away. Let the sadness <coughs> tear your heart out. Your heart can take it. <coughs> For instance, I had a student that she had two kids, she took them to the beach. The girl was eaten by a shark and she really felt guilty. <coughs> Don't sit with your legs crossed, please. Please stop doing that. And then they finally got a hold of the shark and she had to go in and identify the body. And she was really very sad. She was feeling extremely guilty that she let her child go out into the ocean and it wasn't her fault. And that's one of the things that I tried to show her is these things can happen you have to learn to forgive yourself for making a mistake, for not being perfect. Don't eat yourself up alive because of the guilty feeling. Now, the guilty feeling is a feeling of grief. Grief can be in a lot of, coming in a lot of different ways. Grief can be anger, it can be sadness, it can be frustration, whatever it happens to be, you have to learn to forgive that feeling and not get involved with the pain of that feeling. Let the pain be there when it's there, don't fight it, but don't push it away either. Just let it be by itself, okay? Don't make a big deal out of the pain, it's there. That's what I was talking about this afternoon. Allow the pain to be. And there's 
there could be tears, and there's nothing wrong with tears. In some of the Buddhist texts, when he was a bodhisattva, he, uh, his, his parents got eaten by a tiger. And the, he started preparing their body, what was left of it, for cremation, and, and he wasn't crying. And somebody came along and said, oh, you're cooking some meat? They're getting ready to burn the body. And he said, no, that's not meat, that's my parents. And he said, they, the person said to them, why aren't you sad? He said, I have equanimity. And I, I, my mind is so balanced that I don't feel the need to mourn, but to rejoice at the memories of them. Over the years, people have the idea that they're not supposed to cry when they're sad. And that can cause all kinds of physical pains. You're holding it in. The whole thing with learning forgiveness meditation is you can remember when something happened that was very unpleasant and there was a lot of pain. But when you forgive that, you don't hold on to the pain anymore. Okay, that's letting go of the pain. <coughs> so I went with this, my student to the morgue where she had to identify the body of her child. And she said, what am I supposed to do? And I said, don't plan on doing anything. If you feel like crying, you cry. But don't fight it. Don't try to stop it. Don't try to push it down. Let the tears come as long as they want to come. And relax into that. I don't tell them to smile, that's not a smiling situation. But what happened was, she really had a lot of pain, and as she was starting to forgive herself, she made a mistake, okay, that pain started to disappear. And then she started feeling guilty because she thought she should be guilty. So I had another round with her of forgiving, don't do that to yourself. And there was times after someone dies, at first you think about them a lot. Then maybe once a month you have this memory of them doing something and it can make you sad or it can make you happy, depending on the kind of memory you had. But you allow that to be there. You don't try to push anything away. You don't try to control. You don't try to stop. And then that will fade away and then a couple months later you'll have another real strong feeling of sadness or whatever it happens to be. So you six are that, you let it be there. If, this, if the tears want to come, you let them come. And then six months later you might have another one. But that's all right. Now it doesn't hurt near as much. And there's just this feeling of sadness yeah, I really miss them, I wish they were here, but they're not. So you start wishing them happiness. Now one of the things, when you're doing loving kindness, I tell you the person has to be alive. Okay? But that's for this meditation. Quite often, when somebody in the family dies, I tell them to get a picture of them. 
and put it somewhere that they can sit down and talk with them and wish them well. And that helps relieve a lot of the pain and sorrow of their going. So I have people saying, well, can I send loving kindness to somebody that's dead? Yes, of course you can. And that helps you to let go of the pain of them not being there and you still feel like you're helping them. And that's good. The reason that I say you don't want to do that with somebody that's not alive right now is the energy is different. And it goes to the person <coughs> that's alive and they can feel it. And it, it starts to be a reciprocal kind of thing. But when somebody is dead, you don't feel that. But you still can wish them well. On the anniversary of their death, it's a Buddhist tradition to donate food or requisites to the Sangha and share the merit with them. And that makes them happy. And they'll get, they'll have wonderful food appear right before them. And that makes them happy. It doesn't matter what realm they're in. And you can help your parents if they got trapped in having some unwholesome thoughts when they died. Then on the anniversary of their death, they might be a hungry ghost and you start donating food to the Sangha, all of a sudden your parents can eat again. <coughs> and that makes them happy and they get out of the hungry ghost realm and they get into a, a heavenly realm. So you're helping them. And thinking kindly of your parents or whoever it is that died is always a good thing and wishing them well. Okay? So letting go of the pain of the grief is very important. And tears, uh, there's, uh, <coughs> uh, there's different uh, chemistry in tears of sadness than there is tears of frustration or anger. It's just different. And when you have tears of sadness or whatever, that helps cleanse your body of that pain. So it's, it's good to cry. I don't say you have to cry. But when you do forgiveness meditation, quite often you are going to cry. And that's a good thing. Okay. okay. Another Bhante told me that everything is delusion. I bet he didn't tell you what delusion meant. <laughs> if he said delusion, what does it mean? To, I don't know who wrote this, but what I don't want to say. What does delusion mean? What does delusion mean? What? What? Imagination? See, that's what happened to the word delusion. This is one of the ones that's a problem with the dictionary. Um, but in in Buddhism, delusion means the fault, the delusion is a deluded mind. That's where we connect to the definition, deluded mind. And our deluded mind in Buddhism is we believe in an individual self and therefore <coughs> the consequence of that is we take our whole life experience personally. And the moment we start taking it personally, we start suffering. It also means that um, avoid understanding of the Dharma too. No, well, no. There, there is that. No, yes. that's, a, that's the delusion mix up there. Oh, okay. Okay. The misunderstanding of the Dharma. Delusion, not that, but that's more like a, a side of ignorance, connected with ignorance. But our delusion in the texts, our delusion is connected with the I, the self. Okay? And so letting go of that, if we were to take the opposite pole, 
just as an experiment, just as a game. That's why Americans like this. We like games. <laughs> so just for one day, what would happen if you went to your job for one day, 24 hours you spent, and you didn't take anything personally from the moment you work up until you get home at night, and you sat down and you write a, a little report, like if you're a supervisor in something, you had a spiff with somebody at work, a problem, and you look at that and you recount what happened between the, you and the other person, and then you look at it again and you say, what would have happened if I hadn't taken anything personally in that situation? How would that, or how could that situation have happened differently? And what you're going to find is that you're uncovering the difference between war and peace. From taking everything personally in all of our dealings to taking things impersonally, which would mean seeing things as they actually are happening. So when we say that thing here about seeing what is essential and what is unessential, can you, can you go through that, that exercise and see essentially what happened? And see where you were caught in the unessential part of it? Well, taking it personally. Taking it personally. Seeing things as they are depends on perception, person's perception. And this perception is a perception is perceiving and naming what's happening. But your perspective, you are in charge of it. You choose right view or wrong view. And a view is your perspective of life. If you choose to get up tomorrow and take everything personally, believe me where we live, <laughs> If there's no hot water and the toilet won't flush and there's no gas for the stove and all this stuff and I'm annoyed in the morning, my whole day is going to be bad. But if I get up and I just decide to forgive everything and say, well, that's how it is. It's going to be there and arise and pass away. I can still take a cold shower. I can still go to the bathroom, right? I can still get dressed and go, okay, and you keep doing that all day. You're going to find it's a lot more fun and easier much easier much easier because every time you don't like it personally it gets heavier and heavier now if we were to take this this is what i like to do if we were to take this where we talked about it up here and go to the finest point of it and sort of whittle it all down like dr spock and star trek okay all down to the finest point i have a question for you is life happening to you or does it happen from you? The Buddha figured this out. Happening to me. Nothing no. is happening to you at all. <laughs> it's all happening from you. And so in the morning when you get up, if you're stuck thinking it's happening to you, guess what? You can do home, go home and get a white JSO uh, palette with no picture on it, put it up in your room. When you get up in the morning, look at that white picture just white and think I can paint it any color I want today. I can make it anything I want. So as an old Christian, 50 years, believing someday I would die and go to heaven, and believing some of my friends that were Catholic who believed all of this was purgatory already and hell was here, now I come to be a Buddhist and they say, you don't have to die to get to heaven. When you get up tomorrow morning, you can make either heaven or hell every day. But what's the difference between perception and perspective? Perspe perception perceives. It comes from the word perceiving. Perceiving means naming. Okay, by naming, that means when you look at this, okay, you say, this is a microphone. Where is the microphone? <laughs> is it this ring? Is it this screen? Is it here? Is it here? Where is a microphone? Microphone is a concept, and that's what perception does. That makes up this idea of a microphone. Okay, so it's a lot of little parts put together to make this up. We live 
in the world of concepts. Okay. This is a chair. Where is the chair? Is it the legs? Is it the back? Is it the seat? Where is the chair? It's a concept of a lot of things put together. Now, perspective is your view of those concepts. So perception and perspective are very close together, but they're not exactly the same. But we have power over our perspective. Our right. perception is perceiving from memory in our, in our head that we learned as we grew up. You know, the two-year-olds, you watch them building the dictionary. The two-year-olds, you know. And then they end up with the resource to say, shoe, chair, bird, tree, all that, okay. But our perspective, we have a choice. And when I tell people who are really depressed that, or if I talk to somebody who has really had a breakdown and just can't handle being outside, I say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> what if you did it one day at a time and began to understand you created, and all you're responsible for is what you see? Let me ask you something. What's your reality right now? What you're looking at, right? What you see this way, right? My reality is the opposite. What I see is here. My reality is here. Your reality is there. It's funny, isn't it? This is the basis of some quantum physics stuff they're trying to tell you. Live in a hologram. Oh, yay, yay. <laughs> you know, but, 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 but just the idea of that makes everything lighter. I don't have to worry about this. You know, I only have to worry about this until I turn around. Then I don't have to worry about this. I have to worry about that. <laughs> so our, per our perception, our perspective, and our view of everything, you see, it's much less than we thought it was. 